Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like KimuraWare from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode 136 of the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lope. Super excited to have on today, MMA Coach of the Year, Eric Nixick. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy. We're live, we're live on the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lope. Super excited to have on today, Eric Nixick. What is up, brother? Nothing much, man. It's good to, have, good to be on. Thanks for having me. It's going to be a fun little conversation. I, I met... Eric, through uh, a mutual friend, Elliot Marshall, former UFC guy that uh, I've become really close friends with in the last little while. So it's it's amazing to see what Eric has done. And and he looks so young on TV, but man, you've been at this game for a little while now, the whole MMA <laughs> game. So we're going to get into that. So let's start off with Eric. Where did you grow up? Siblings? Had you go to school? What got you in that route? Was it like wrestling? Like what got you into the route of mixed martial arts? Uh, yeah, so I'm born and raised in Las Vegas. Uh, same with my mom. We're, we're like second, almost third generation Las Vegas born. So see, seen a lot of growth out of this city yeah. um, in my, my 41 years here. Uh, so I have a little sister and uh, my dad was a, a, a football coach. Uh, my uncle as well. They coached the same high school together that I played at. My mom ran a glass company here. She was um, in, in like basically helped build uh, casinos and hotels. So she ran a really uh, multi-million dollar glass company in the development of Las Vegas. So kind of, kind of a cool story, man. Uh, and then, um, yeah, football was always my sport played for my dad. I was uh, 14 years old on varsity as a freshman on varsity football um, played my four years with the old man and played a little bit of defense. And that's where my dad was a uh, defensive coordinator. And he used to just, bro, it was bad. He used to, <laughs> he used to get on me so bad. And, uh, um, there was a practice where he just, he yelled at me so bad. The, the head coach moved me back over to offense. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, he said, bro, I, he, he calls me in his office. He's like, man, I can't take your dad yelling at you anymore. I'm going to move you over to offense. So that year, uh, he moves me over to offense and I was first team all state. I broke the Nevada state reception record. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was a good move for me. Um, decided to go to university of Nevada, Reno, uh, wanted to play ball up there and just, just didn't really work out well for me, man. I was a young kid. I graduated at 17. I graduated young. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think, I think just the environment of college and being out of the house and just really took, took, uh, took too, too, too much fun in the, in the partying and the, in the outside perspective of rather than football And I transferred out to Dixie junior college out in St. George, Utah, ended up finishing up school there, playing ball there and moving back to Vegas. And then, um, when you, when you did that football, when you first, got in there into the college realm did you have mindset of pros i i didn't i didn't have the i don't i i don't i remember thinking to myself like it was the first time i think where i didn't have like an uh an, it was the first time i had like an off season where i wasn't training and when you're in that regiment and looking back at it now like since i was eight years old i wore helmets and shoulder pads and I trained every day. I did something every day, football related. And then all of a sudden you didn't, like you didn't have to, you know, and, and, and here's my dad, my uncles, everybody that was all coaches on the team, coaches I looked up to. I was in the weight room or I was doing something football related, whether it was film study or running routes yeah. every day. And then all of a sudden I didn't have to. And I think that cost me, man. I think it, it, it messed my routine up. It, it, it messed my psyche up in a way where it, it I wouldn't say it made me lazy, but I just knew there was, there was like, I just, it was, it was almost like I was burned out in a lot of ways, I think. So, yeah, yeah you know, and that, and that was, uh, that was, I think kind of what, what ended up making me a little bit more lackadaisical in my approach. And then uh, getting, getting kicked out of school, I was an eye opener and then, then it reshuffled the cards for me. And, you know, when I got to St. George, Utah, there wasn't anything to do but lift weights and play football. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, there's no trouble to get in when you're out there. So I, I think I kind of needed that just for my growth. Yeah, that's beautiful. So where did the, I guess, entrance into martial arts? 
I'll tell you what, Jeff, I, for me, it was uh, the camaraderie. It was the people. And I was lost. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do um, after football. I was pursuing a career in the fire service. I was going through my um, paramedic. I got hired on by two fire departments here at City North Las Vegas and City. Uh, did really well. I was number two on the list. And unfortunately for me, when the background check came up, that that fight I got in Reno when I was 17, it just turned 18, reared its ugly head. And they they wouldn't hire me because of a fight I got in the dorms in college. So that eliminated me from a, a career in the fire service. And I was crushed, man. It was my dream. Um, you know, out of about 5,000 people that tested, I was number two on that list. I was a shoe in for two departments. I had my choice. I could pick. You know, I scored a 98. I was the second highest. So, you know, it was hard, man. And uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was training over at Extreme Couture. But at um, the same time, this was my passion. I wanted to I wanted to be a, a firefighter. Yeah. And once that once that kind of dissipated, I I looked around my surroundings and I just I, I you know, I was in the gym. I was training with the with Randy and the guys and I, I was running a class or two at the time. But what really got my foot in the door was just the, the fact that I just wanted to be around like minded individuals. I wanted to be around people that um, pushed me and, and, and elevated my standards a lot of ways. I was bartending. I bartended for almost 20 years, man. That was my job that I made money. And uh, I started to see my surroundings more and more. I started to see the people that were in the bar industry, they'd get off of work. They'd gamble their money away, they'd smoke, they'd drink, they'd party, and they'd just go to sleep and do it all over again. And I think uh, the eye-openers for me was like just seeing the ages of the people that were doing it. And I was like, man, this is a trap. And I got to yeah. I gotta figure out a way to get the hell out of this. What does the bartending role do for me? It serves a purpose. It's a job. It pays the bills. It gives me money. But it also can be a detriment when you stay trapped in that circle. So that's kind of when I just decided I really wanted to focus more on the gym and, and uh, be in the gym more and put my energy in the gym. And then that's when Randy offered me the gym manager role. So I took over the gym and started running the, the business more and, uh, you know, and coaching a lot more. So everything kind of just fell when you believed in yourself and, and uh, got rid of all the other bullshit in your life. Now, I mean, going from training to coaching, I mean, that's, there's a big gap there. Where did that gap start and, and how did you like really, really tone your, your, your skills and all that? Or who, were, who were you under? Like who, who really, really guided you? Obviously, I'm sure, I'm sure Randy did, but who else really guided you in that process? De- Dennis Davis, for sure. Yeah. Um, he was, he was my main, he is my main coach. He's the guy that I, I rely on immensely. Um, Robert Fallis, obviously when Fallis was there, uh, I th- I'd say definitely those two and Ray Seffo. Yeah. So I had, I had this, uh, this brotherhood of, of great coaches, um, and, and guys with, with lineage, obviously through team quest and Randy. And yeah. that's kind of what, that's kind of what, like where I always knew I was going to coach. I just assumed it would be in football and uh, I did coach a little football, but man, I, I, I just fell in love with MMA. I fell in love with so many different aspects of MMA that just, I was gravitated to, and uh, those those guys really open open the doors for me. You know, it was funny because I was talking to Ray about it yesterday. You know, I was training alongside Ray, but I was just doing more grappling and stuff. And here's yeah. Ray, six six time world champ, K1 kickboxer. But I look at him as a resource. Yeah. And I looked over at him, and I you know we were friends for two three years already, and I didn't hold pads. I didn't really know how to hold pads. I didn't know much about striking and. I just kind of let my vulnerability go. And I just said, Hey, Ray, like I I like to learn how to hold pads. And he said, okay, brother, no problem. Be here every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 AM. And you can hold pads for me. You're going to learn how to hold pads. So I got to learn pads, how to hold pads from the greatest, one of the greatest kickboxers in the planet to ever do it, you know? And it was just really just stepping outside my comfort zone and just, just asking the question, you know, what was the worst he could say? No. You know, and I was like, all right, I'm in man. And then, you know, had it not been, and for Ray, I don't think I'm, I'm where I'm at today for some of the stuff that I know. I love that because that's there's a lesson there to be learned. And this is something I'm very passionate about is, is a lot of whether you're an entrepreneur, coach, doesn't matter what you are. A lot of people never get to the next level or they struggle along the way because they're scared of asking the damn questions. For sure. The crazy thing to me that I realized too, Jeff, is like there's so many guys that you look up to, like Henry Hoof and Trevor Whitman and guys in my field that I really look up to. Those are the ones that when you ask them a question, they're the ones that usually make themselves available more than anything. And a lot of times you're just intimidated because you look up to them. 
And one day I just remember like seeing Henry, I was always kind of intimidated by him. And I went over to him and I shook his hand. I said, I'm a big fan of what you do and just kind of broke the ice. And he's been, he's been such a great influence on me in my, in my career ever since. And all it really took was just a, just an opportunity to go say hi to him, you know? And I think once you feel the, the need to step outside your comfort zone, it just opens up so many other doors. And people don't even realize too. And it's funny because I, before, before this podcast, I was a, a guest on a, on a show in, um, in uh, Jamaica, actually, it was it was a Zoom on Jamaica. And I was it was a coaching show on for entrepreneurs, and and that was one of the lessons I was trying to explain to people was find if you're trying to start your own business, you're trying to do anything on your own, just find somebody that's where you want to be, somebody that's already succeeded. At. Most people that are successful have no issues helping you; yeah. they have no issues passing on their knowledge, and the amount of lessons you can learn, all the mistakes they did that you won't do is invaluable. Like you can't put a dollar on that, right? Man, 100%. And and that's like when I have those, I call it church. It's like going to church yeah, with me yeah. when you sit down with Henry Yeah, and you know, he, he's, he's very transparent and he'll talk, he'll tell you things that he's seeing and, and things that you need to be better at and, and the way he communicates with you. And, you know, you can't pay top dollar for that, but oh. you're absolutely right, man. And like, he's, he's, and, and anytime he's ever brought it up, He's always said to me, there's a day that you're going to repay this to some other coach. Yeah. Pave the way, pave the way, man. You know, and, and that, that's always been something that, I, that has, has made me feel good. And he said to me one day, I, I picked him up and we're, I was driving him back to the hotel cause he had a fight and you no, know, he got, he got quiet. I dropped him off in the valet and, and he doesn't really say anything. I was like, all right, see you coach. You know, and he, he doesn't get out of the car and he sits there and he says, Hey, one day I'm going to be, I'm going to be gone. Like I'm not going to be coaching this anymore. He goes, I feel good knowing that I'm leaving this sport over to guys like you because you care, you care about your people, you care about your fighters. And that meant, that meant a lot to me coming from him. You know, he's a guy I look up to a lot and a guy that I try to model my game after. So, yeah. you know, having that, having that support with guys like him that, that have zero, zero invested interest in me. He runs his own gym. We run competing gyms, if you will. Yeah. And it's not about that, man. It's not about his ego. It's about seeing good people succeed. Yeah, I love that. And and in most in reality is most successful people are like that. I think I it's just it's just taking that fear of I guess that fear of rejection, right? I mean, that's most people why they don't succeed in life is that fear of rejection and taking exactly. that away and just taking opportunity. We're okay, let's okay, I want to talk about your family and stuff like that, but let's let's give me give me two or three really awesome stories of just as a coach, athletes at their peak doing something special that you just you know, obviously I, I know one of them or two of them and they're really really up there with um uh Nagato. but just give me a couple stories even it could be even just guys amateurs that you just had a small ear to ear when they accomplished something and they listened to you and they had that heart and and, and you were part of that journey so, oh man for me definitely dan Ige. um just our, our our journey together and i think we, we, we bring each other up, you know, yeah. and, and we, we started on the regional scene together. You know, I had guys in the big show at the time, but for Dan and I, there's something to be said about when you go on the road and you're fighting on these regional shows and the hotels, uh, the, and exactly the hotel, the weight cuts and, you know, the, the unknown, like, where are we staying? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I got food poisoning one trip. I'm barfing all over the hotel and he's trying to cut weight. <laughs> I yeah. just, just, you know, and I think when you combinate all of those things, you combine all of those things and, and the time we've been on the road together and the laughs, and it's just me and him, man, in the hotel room. It's when you fat, get on this, becomes, it becomes family. It becomes family. It becomes yeah. this level of sweat equity that yeah. no one, no one ever really understands. And people always ask like, man, like when you and Dan get in the corner and you guys get on the stool, just, it feels different. And yeah. that's why, man, like we've been through everything together. And I, I just, I cherish my, my relationship with him. I cherish my friendship with him, our, our coach and fighter relationship. There's just nothing that's un, untouchable in our life. We, we speak every day. Um, and if I'm down, he's bringing me up and vice versa. I just love the kid, man. And, and, and to me, my journey in MMA will always be synonymous with, 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 with Dan's journey in MMA. But moreover, I, I just feel like we're making ourselves better men, better fathers, better husbands that one day this MMA sport's going to be gone. And, but at the, at the end of it, we're going to be with each other through, you know, through thick and thin, no matter what. So 
definitely my, my, my relationship with Dan is probably one of my, my proudest moments, especially when it comes to just MMA alone, but life in general. I love it. I love it. I love it. And again, when, when did you start working with him and how did you originally meet him? So Francis started training, um, at the gym after his loss to Derek Lewis. Yeah. Um, he was in Vegas. He split time over in, um, France he trained over at another gym in Vegas. He was kind of PI bouncing around. He really didn't have a home. And then it was the Curtis blades two fight. He yeah. really started to just anchor down and find a home. And, you know, we never really, um, were coach and fighter relationship, but we were more friends. And, and I think for him, he has to build a trust with you. And I like that because I feel like for us as coaches, it needs to be organic and not forced. And then over time, he would he would ask more questions or be at more practices and ask for more things out of me or, you know, and it was the Cain Velasquez fight. His manager called me. And it was funny because he he comes to practice late and I jumped to shit. You know, I was like, hey, man, practice starts at three thirty. You need to be here on time, ready to go. I don't care who you are or whatever. And I'm good friends with his manager, Markel Martin, and Markel calls me um about you know about an hour after practice and i was like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna hear from him you know? <laughs> and uh he's like hey what do you think about working with francis and i was like oh i was like why i go i, I jumped it's, to it's, shit <laughs> i jumped to you, shit today but you, you did something that a lot of people need is accountability yep he said that i were, care yeah it's a care the accountability is caring right if you're if you yeah. hold somebody accountable for their actions it's it's a sense of care you're, you you give a shift so i love that my dad used to always say, he said, man, when a coach stops talking to you, that's when you have to worry. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you have to worry, man. Cause he doesn't care anymore, you know? And, and I just, I always saw the potential that Francis has not only as a human being, but as an athlete. And I just felt like he was just cutting corners in, in, in the littlest things, man. And I was like, man, you're, you, you just got to get a championship mindset, you know, and let's work on those things. And, so I think just being around the gym and the team and the standard that we have as, as a staff and coaches and being in the environment really just helped him form a bond that he was looking for. You know, he uh, so I started working with him on the Junior Dos Santos fight. Um, then Jarzinho, obviously COVID hit. And that's when him and I really became like family, family, because it was just me and him. We didn't have anybody else. And. You know, um, I, I remember coming home and it was a couple of weeks into the mandatory quarantine here in Vegas and to asking my wife and kids, I said, Hey, you know, I, I could tell Francis was depressed. He lives at home by himself. He doesn't know where to go. Only thing he had to look forward to is coming to the gym in the mornings and working out with me. And that was it. It was just me and him. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was getting the shit kicked out of me, man, for 14 <laughs> weeks. So I just said, um, you know, I, I would like to be able to have Francis come over for dinner if you guys would be okay with that. You know, I know that we're all trying to stay isolated and quarantined, but I'm obviously working out with him. So, and yeah, he's going home. Yeah. Why not have him over, man? And I'll tell you what, it changed everybody's lives in a lot of ways because we weren't stuck in the mundane routine of seeing the same faces. Now it's Francis in the house and Francis is here hanging out for hours on end. He's playing with the kids and he doesn't even want to go home. And <laughs> then, then there's days where like, I didn't call him or invite him. He just shows up and he's at the <laughs> house and hanging out. But man, it really, um, it really made us a, a family and, and a support system that I don't think that he had. And I think that we needed. So that's when our relationship, I felt like just really blossomed. I love it. I love it. I love it. Fatherhood. Because you just mentioned your children. Uh, you have three children. Yes. What are the ages? 13, 11, and four. 13. So 13 and four, that's a gap. Yeah. Two that's girls. It. And then uh, my wife wanted to try for the boy. <laughs> and we got him. We got him. So yeah. Is that it for now? Yeah, that's, that's it. I got a, pu <laughs> I got a puppy just the last week. So what, what, that's type, what, right what, what type of dog? We got a, a Frenchie. Oh, Frenchie. Yeah. What does fatherhood mean to you? Man, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've been struggling a lot lately just with, with the amount of work that I've been in. And, and uh, you know, I, I posted a picture a couple of days ago on my Instagram and it was a picture of my wife and three kids without the dad, you know, and, and they're all at the beach and they're all doing vacations. And, you know, so 
uh, fatherhood to me, I guess, is balance, I guess, is the be- best word I can I can say is because I understand that my job provides, but it also takes away a lot of time and, and, and uh, resources when, you know, they're on these vacations at summertime and uh, I'm here working. It's tough. It gets tough on me. So I think um, for me, it's just understanding the right amount of balance and the right amount of energy to, to provide, but also be a good dad. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and it is finding that. And it's, I, I, I call it, I coach a lot of dads, right? And I call it the non negotiables. You have to really, I mean, you're 41. So are your parents both around still? Yeah. Mom and dad live, live pretty close. Okay. So you see them on a regular basis, right? Pretty regular. I'd say probably once a week or once every other week. Okay, good, good. So you're lucky that way. And you just have to look at what things are are, are non-negotiable in your life, right? I mean, mm. one thing you have to put in your head is, and there's a stat, 90% of the FaceTime we're going to spend with our kids is before the age of 18. Mm-hmm. So when you put that in your head and you start calculating that, and, and then you look at your parents and like, how old are your parents? They're in their 70s. I just lost my dad at 76. 11 weeks wow. ago, buddy. And it's been, and, and he was my best friend and it's yeah. been the hardest 11 weeks of my life. And when you look at the average person lives 80, and if your parents are in their 70, that might be five, six, if you're lucky, seven summers left with them. So you have to, yeah. you start, when you start thinking of those things in your head and the non-negotiables and you start looking at time as a currency, you start prioritizing stuff. Right. And it's just right. figuring out how to sacrifice and how to prioritize those non-negotiables in your life. Right. And in, in, in a lot of dads, their mindset is they, they, it's like, I, I got to spend three hours for, it could be half an hour, but be present, be present, be off your phone. Yep. That's all it is, man. Be present, build memories with them and just, and fill their memory bank that one day when, one day when you're not around or you're in your elders, they'll be able to tell their children about all the memories you've built with them. Right. So yeah, yeah it's just, just, just finding that balance and, 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 and living with no regrets because if something were to happen, like you not being there on vacation and you didn't regret that. Right. So just Yo, looking man. at those things. Right. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So your, your career right now, I would say in your head, it's been what the last, I would say 12 to 24 months of your career is really blossoming and getting in the right direction. Yeah, I think so. I think when you start to look at like, I guess like accolades or things of that sort, but you know, I've always been a firm believer in just keeping your head down and grinding and, and understanding that good things will happen. Um, the, and the, just ju- it, the journey, the journey, the process, right? The yeah. process is part of the product and I enjoy the process. So I just know that like, you know, we, we create good fighters. My fighters will speak for themselves, right? That'll, that'll, that the product will be part of the coaching and, and you don't have to be loud and boisterous. You have to you be, be original and, stay who you are and stay the course and good things will happen, man. And, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. So I'm, I'm glad the way things are, are, are formulating now, but um, all in all, I just think it's just a product of who we are as a team in a gym and, and the environment we surround ourselves with. How many athletes do you take on, on under your wing at one time? Oh, that's, I gotta... that's, that's, that's very, it's, it's very, and I talked to Elliot about it and he's working. I think he said he's working with three right now. And it's just like, when he, when the training camps come along, it's, it's, there's a lot of dedication there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm up there. I'm up there pretty, pretty big. So, I mean, I haven't had a weekend off really like this weekend, I'm going to corner three fighters. So I'll have two in the UFC. I'll fly out on Sunday to go corner one of my guys on a, a car down in San Diego on Sunday night, and then I'll fly back. So um, yeah, I, I probably have upwards of 30, maybe 35 fighters. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm coaching a lot right now. Um, that number needs to get whittled down. I've already kind of made that, that, okay, I'm going to start trimming some of the fat and it really just is, you know, my, I, I can only do so much and I'm such a passionate coach where I want to give you 110% and you can only really give that so often throughout the day. And I, it dilutes, it, it really just dilutes my product. So Guys like Danny Gay and Francis and Jeremy Kennedy and Kai Kamaka, my main guys and my main people, you know, I'm just going to make sure that I, they, they're getting my time because they, they for one, they, they give it to me and, and I just enjoy being on that journey with them. What's an average day of you get, getting up? What time you get up? How many classes do you do? Actually, is it all one-on-one or you still do classes as well? 
So I, I coached my the Monday pro practice, but I'm there for all the pro practices um, Monday through Thursday. We have different coaches that will come and come in and jump in and, and run some stuff. But mostly sparring days are just a hard warm up. But we're there for sparring. Um, yesterday I was there for wrestling, wasn't wrestling, but I was there watching, you know, and just being there, I think is important. That kind of boots on the ground mentality. Yeah. Um, but I, I get up in the morning and uh, I'll be around the house. Cause it's like the best time in the morning was with my son and my kids. And, you know, it's kind of that like hour where you get the day going and then I'll get in the gym and I'll have my first session in the morning. Today will be like Cynthia Calvillo. I'll, I'll, I'll have a session or two in the mornings. I'll try to maybe get two or three in before, um, before lunch. Then I'll go to lunch, um, get my office work done, and then I'll be ready for, for, for pro, pro practice. And then sometimes after pro, I'll do do a thing or two. And today I'll actually jump into quarantine with Kai and Cheyenne and go cut way with them tonight. So um, my wife set me up with a Google calendar. She's <laughs> like, hey, you need to... <laughs> You need to start. You need to start doing this. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely need a, you need an organized calendar. Cause... I get away with it though, Jeff, because I'm always at the gym. So if I if I miss something, so they're like, hey, are we supposed to hit pads? Like, oh yeah, be right there. <laughs> so I'm always in there anyway. So it works out. You travel a lot, so uh, you're essentially every weekend you're you're on you're in a plane some way or another, right? Unless I mean you're in Vegas, so a good amount of the cards are there, so you're lucky in that direction. Yeah, very, very fortunate in that regard, for sure. I don't know if I had to travel if, if uh, my wife would be too happy with me, but that has been definitely a godsend that the uh, fights have been at the apex. So, you know, yes, I, I might be out of the house. I'm staying in the hotel, but I'm, I'm a phone call. I'm, I'm literally 10 minutes away from the house. So and then when the fights are over, it's amazing. I get to come right home. That's been yeah. the, the best. Like, you don't have to sit in a hotel and wait and pack and get ready to go and then get on the airplane and fly from East coast to West coast. It's just like, yeah. you're already home, you know? So that part's been amazing for sure. Were you, I'm assuming you were a part of fight Island. You were on there. First how, one. Yeah. How, how long were you there for period wise, man? I, I, the first fight Island, I had three fighters. I had, um, I had Jared Gordon and that was by coincidence because uh, his camp ended up testing positive for COVID Oh. a week before we went to fly out. So he knew I was going to be there. Um, and then they, it was myself and Paul Felder. We ended up cornering him to a victory. Uh, Dan Ige fought Calvin Cater and then Joe Benavidez fought uh, Davidson Figueredo. So I was out there for about two weeks, I believe the first one. How was that yeah. experience? <laughs> it was kind of like the twilight zone, you know, it was just, <laughs> it was I've heard weird. that from a few people. Yeah, it was weird, man. It was like a sci-fi movie. Everybody's in these like, hazmat suits and you know you're at, walking around this five-star hotel but you can't go anywhere so you gotta stay in your room and you know it's just it just got like groundhog's day you know every day is the same food same shit um you know the only really uh like sanctity that you had i guess is i brought my playstation so i just played warzone all day and uh we trained a lot you know so it was good like me and felder were there so paul and i trained a whole bunch and you know there's a there's a there's a kind of a uh, an underworld of, of camaraderie amongst certain coaches and, and we get together and we'll spend time with one another. And that's always pretty cool and, and picking guys brains and hanging out. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you deal with the best you can with your time, but man, Nick, you're stuck in that room. When you get there, 48 hour quarantine, you can't leave your room. You're in there, bro. You're not going anywhere at all. So it's just like, Holy shit. Get me out of here. Yeah. It's crazy. He's on TV from the outside and, I mean, you're, you're looking in and seeing this paradise and you think these guys are like lucky shits. We're locked down here, but it's pure office. I had, I had a, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I talked to a few people there and they said the exact same thing as you have. Just, it's, it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't all the, the fun everybody saw on TV and all that. Right. Yeah. Where do you see yourself coaching wise over the next like five, 10 years? Where do you see that? Like what, what, what's the, what's, do you have a longer term plan for this? Like, I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of wear and tear. Like I said, eventually you're gonna have to cut down and trim some fat and just really hone down who you want to be around and all that. But what's a long-term play? Cause I mean, you've already, I mean, you've been at it for a while, but you've already accomplished quite a bit. I mean, obviously accolades with fighter, of the uh, coach of the year and, and, and coaching champs, and you've built those relationships where they're going to be long-term friendships with big, where's, where's the long-term play with this? You know, I, I've thought about like, business ventures and, and how I want to step out maybe outside a little bit of the realm of MMA, but kind of in that, like, you know, we're, we're dabbling in the podcast things and we're doing some other things as far as like, you know, 
business wise goes that I, I want to just set up and diversify a little bit. Yeah. And um, one of the things I've really been enjoying has been uh, so this will be actually my fifth semester going over to UNLV School of Business. And uh, oh. they have me over there for uh, I do a leadership um, speaking for uh, one of the business classes. and It'll be my fifth one. And it was always so much fun to go to. But what's been really cool is, is lately I've been getting a lot of letters back from some of the students that have been in that class. And one guy wrote in his uh, acceptance letter to Florida State some of the things we talked about in my class, you know, and then some of the impact that some of those lessons that he's had. And those things have really like inspired me to maybe step outside my comfort zone a little bit and maybe expand and maybe like motivational speaking or, or, or coaching or doing some things outside of the realm of MMA and maybe helping um, just normal people, you know, and, and giving, maybe changing their mindset a little bit. Uh, that's been something that's been a goal of mine, but um, you know, as far as the MMA side of it goes, it was funny because Francis and I were talking about this uh, last week and when he won the title, yes, we were very happy. And what I like about our mindset was like, all right, all right, what's next? Like, we're not finished, right? We're not, we're we're hungry still. And what do we want to do now? What do we want to do next? And how good do you want to be? How great do you want to be? You know, like those, those kind of things. And, and I just love being around that mentality, man. And, and uh, we weren't satisfied with the, with the win when, a lot of guys, I think when they win the title, their hardest fight in their entire career as champions is their first title defense. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. You know? So like, I just, I'm looking forward to that next challenge. I'm looking forward to that next opportunity. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it's John Jones just because I, I would like to compete against the guy of that stature. And, um, you never know. We'll see. But, uh, I, I just liked, I like, I like is that, the is that, challenges. That, that, it's funny. Cause one of my, one of my, one of my staff here is like an MMA, MMA nerd, if you want to call it. And, uh, and it was funny because when I was talking, I was going to come on and talk to you right now. And it, it's just, our, our studio is in our actual office, a Kamora head office. And, and he's he's like, as well with the John Jones fight. Yeah. So he said, is that, is that in the, is that something that you guys really would look at consider? I'm an optimist by nature. So when this whole thing with gone and Lewis, hit, yeah. I just like, all right, in my head, I'm like, well, maybe that opens the door for John, John and, and Francis for like Madison square garden or something. Oh, you know, I'm just massive, 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 man. And like, bro, I just get goosebumps thinking about that. <laughs> you know, like that's the opportunity that I, I want. Like I, I want to compete against the best. I want to compete against in my mind, one of the best coaches in the game and Brandon Gibson. Yeah. Greg Jackson, yeah. you know, Winkle John, um, man, like that, that, that inspires me. That gets me up and motivated, you know? So, and, and so does any, uh, you know, fighting for a title or defending it. If it's Lewis or gone. Yes. Yeah. I'll be just as motivated. But when you talk about the stature and you know, the mystique of John Jones, yeah, man, yeah. That, that fight, that fight excites me. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty, pretty yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a hundred percent in greens with you with that. There is, when you look at, I love what you said that you continue with, with Nagano, with Francis, when you guys sat down, you're always hungry. You need that. With the mindset, how much of your coaching is focused on the mindset? I'd say upwards to like 80%. It's, it's, it's crazy. Huh? It's, it's crazy how, how this is not only you, this is Major League Baseball, NHL. Like just, it's just the game in sports in general at that pro level has changed so drastically over the last probably five to six years. Big time. And thankfully for me at an early age and, and a little bit in high school, I played quarterback. And I remember my dad telling me, he's like, remember, you have 10 other personalities on the field with you. Some you can grab by the face mask, some you have to hug and coddle, some you can yell at certain ways, but you got to understand who and what you're talking to. You have to know your audience. He said, lead by example, you know, play the game with your hair on fire. But when you go and like yell at one, the receiver for dropping a ball, that might hurt them. That might make it worse, right? Like you have to get to know these people and understand what they need and what they need to hear. So I think just being around your, your team and your fighters and being on the road with them and understanding their personalities, what inspires them, what's their whys, um, it really helps you understand their mental side of things because 
you got to know why they're in this sport, man. You, you got to have a loose screw. Are you yeah. a, are you a fighter by nature? Are you a competitor? Are you an athlete? Like what attributes got you into this sport? And then you, it gives you some idea of, of how to approach them and how to kind of conquer their fears, if you will, you know? So that to me has been the, the, my, my favorite part about the sport. And, and a lot of times that one minute you have in the corner is like my, my symphony, man. I love that part. <laughs> I love that part. Like, I just feel like I, that's where I belong, man. Is that minute, that one minute we have to make adjustments or give the proper message and send it right yeah. back out there. I love it. Your wife, what does she mean to you? Oh. How, long, how long have you been married for? Uh, so we're high school sweethearts. Oh, you are. So, okay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So we started, we started dating in 1997. Uh, we've been married 15 years. Uh, man, she's my everything, like complete everything. So, so you're very, uh, you're very close to me. Cause I've been, I'm 44. I've been married for 18 years. Yeah. Those days yeah. we started, we started right out of high school and getting to know each other. Yeah. That's very cool. She, she's, uh, the, the glue that holds everything together for me. Um, she's a lot of my, my, my wise, like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't get to do this job and this, have this career without her, her, her motivation, the way she pushes me, um, just constant love and support, you know, times where I feel like uh, I'm, I'm not doing the right things. Or if I'm, if I'm, you know, even like last week when I was kind of down and out that I missed this trip, she's like, Hey, don't worry about it. Like we know there'll be more trips to come. We'll make those happen. Right. Like just kind of keeps me level-headed and even keel. Um, she's your anchor. I, she's your anchor she's, at home. She, she's my anchor at home, man. I, I, I definitely outkick my coverage. She's drop dead gorgeous. <laughs> you know, she makes, she, she's, she's so the, for me, I think the, the, the best part about our relationship is I got to fall in love with my wife in like sections. And what I mean by that, like I fell in love with her in high school as a high school sweetheart. And that's a different type of love. You know, yeah. we went away to college. We went to separate colleges. We had breakups and long distance relationships and ups and downs and trying to figure that out. And then, you know, we fell in love again and it was a different type of love. And then there's as a fiance and then as a wife and then man, like, you fall in love with her in a different way when she's the mother of your kids, yeah, you know? Yeah. So it's just always been like this evolution. I think of, of our relationship, we've been able to mold and form one another into the spouses that we want each other to be. And we reciprocate that back to one another. We challenge each other. We push each other. And, you know, man, like she just got her vaccination this week and she's been feeling a little down and out yesterday. Yeah. And I was like, just scared. Like, Oh, you're all right. Like, <laughs> But you fucking die on me. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I do without you, man. So yeah, man, she's, she's my everything. And, you know, a lot of times when, especially when Francis won, you know, she's the first person I wanted to call, like just FaceTime yeah. because a lot of people don't understand the time that is taken away from her. And the time that's taken away from my family is really, you know, it was, it's them. It's the ones, they're the ones that suffer from it. So a win like that. And, and those victories, those, those really go to them. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love, I've, you know what I've, I, I've coached and I've talked to a lot of husbands and no one's ever mentioned in that level where you re fall in love at different stages. And it's so true. Yeah. And I, to be honest, I haven't even thought about it. I love when you said when you became a mom, it's a different love. Now you appreciate yeah. her, her, her vulnerability, but her also her, I mean, I explained it, but it's just her, just her, 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 her a way to just comfort and love your children. You're seeing that and you're like, wow, like this, that love, they, and, you're, and it's almost like you love the way she loves her kids. It's unreal. Like you, yeah. there's no words for it. It's just yeah. by action. You see it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh man, like just, just everything about it, man. Like, and I think that's the, the most beautiful time I've ever seen my wife is when she's pregnant. Like, it's just yeah. like, there's like a glow about her. It's like <laughs> majestic, you know? And I, I, I loved watching her, you know, I love watching her as a mom, you know, yeah. it's amazing to see. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's comes in, comes in phases for sure. I'm sure somebody's asked you this before um, the MMA world. Did you ever have that itch to, and I, I don't know if you have, because this is my curiosity. So I said, I don't do tons of research on people. I just like having open conversations. Did you ever compete or wanted to compete at that level? Yeah. So I never, I never got in the sport. Cause I was like, I'm going to be a pro fighter. Um, and then really my, when I was, when I got in the sport, my focus was, was on the fire department, but I was training 
And then during that time, I got offered to fight Ryan Bader. And uh, Dennis Davis was fighting on the same card, my head coach. Yeah. And the, the promoter comes in the gym and here's me and Dennis were training and the promoter's like, we need a, we need a fight. Uh, we need a matchup for Ryan Bader. And I knew Bader. I knew from football and played up in Reno. I was yeah. at Dixie or I, mean, yeah. I was in Vegas, you know? So yeah. I, I knew him and I knew he was good. I knew he was tough. I just knew him more as a wrestler than anything. Yeah. And I, my wife is pregnant with McKenna our first. Um, I remember going home and she's like ready to bust pregnant. I was like, <laughs> Hey babe, um, what do you think? I got offered to fight Ryan Bader for two thousand dollars. She's like, "Are you out of your fucking mind?" <laughs> like, I'm, I'm pregnant, ready to bust. This guy's a savage. He's probably gonna <laughs> spike you on your head and break your neck. You're, you're, uh, you know, you're a test away from getting hired on by the fire department for a career job. You don't even really care to be a pro fighter, you know, like all these other things. And I was like. Yeah, I guess you're right. You know, <laughs> she probably saved me from a lifetime in a wheelchair by not having to fight that guy. So yeah, I mean, and that was really the one the one time where I was like entertaining the idea to do it, and it really just never presented itself again to where I, I could have, I guess, but it just I never was like, oh, this is what I need to do, and this is what I wanted to do. So for a while there, there was a, a level, I guess, of um, imposter syndrome when as a coach because it's like man, all these coaches, all these great coaches were all pro fighters. So why was a fighter going to trust me when I haven't fought on a professional level? And I remember in college, I had an offensive coordinator who never played football, never even played ball. And I had a problem with that. Like, it just didn't resonate well with me. And I remember calling my dad, who is in the Nevada State Hall of Fame as a coach, like he's a genius when it comes to defense. And I said, you know, dad, like, you know, this coach never even played. Like, how am I supposed to listen to that guy? And he said, listen, I'll tell you what, there's coaches that have never played the game. They're going to know more insight because they're not formed in a certain way. Yeah. They're not, they're not brought up in a certain like lineage or this yeah. or this or yeah. that. So they, yeah. they're, they're actually outside the box thinkers. Yeah. And sometimes you can learn a lot from those types of coaches. And I was like, you know what? You're right. And sure as shit, man, this coach was just above and beyond in, in his mindset and the way he saw the game. And I use that. I use that for me when it came to MMA. I was like, you know, for one, I need to be on the mats. I need to train. I need to be in the room. I need to be able to spar and do all these things with the guys so they trust me. But number two, I, I need to think outside the box and I need to figure out ways to approach them and give them ideas and thoughts and theories that is different from what maybe a typical MMA coach might give them. And I think that's where I found my niche was one. I didn't lie about it. I heard coaches lie about the fights they had and which was all bullshit. Cause there's a thing called Google. And, you know, I think like just being transparent yeah. and open and honest, yeah. um, authenticity. Won me over authenticity. authenticity, man, it, yeah. it won me over people. So, you know, and, and, uh, now I, I kind of, I, I take pride in the fact that I'm at the level that I'm at to this day and never having to fight competitively. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. I got one more question for you, and I and I and this is the only question I have set at the end of our uh, podcast. I always ask everybody: if something were to happen to you today, in a few words, how would you want to be remembered or described by your loved ones? Oh, that's that's easy for me. I, I I would I would just want people to say that that he cared, like he was a, he was he was good to me. He cared. Um, he made the time and effort when he didn't have to. Um, you know, I think my, I hope that my energy and my passion will be missed. And, um, I just hope that my name is synonymous with integrity. You know, I hope people feel like, man, this, this dude was a man of his word. He was good to me. He was a good person. Uh, he was a good dad and a good husband. You know, that's how I, I, I would hope to be remembered. Um, you know, as a, as a human being, to be honest with you. I love it. I love it. I love it. How could the audience follow you and what would they, um, is there any way that anything you want to like end this conversation with to tell the audience? No, I just, man, I, I, I forget how far reach that we have with people with social media. You know, I, I forget about that. And, and I think sometimes you're naive to the fact that, um, you know, you can, you can really help a lot of people yeah. with, with good messages. Um, you know, I, I think people should be aware of what they're putting out there energy wise, you know, like 
you see those, you see those websites where it's like a, a fight in a, in a taco bell, you know, and, and, and what, what that does to your energy, right? It's yeah. like, every time you see something bad on social media, you should I immediately post something good. You yeah. know, I think, I think just having that, that mentality, you know, and, and, and uh, for me, I, I just, I feel like if you want to follow me or get a hold of me, you know, it's, it's my Instagram, it's at Eric underscore XCMMA. And then, uh, you know, follow myself and Elliot, our podcast, Seconds Out, Seconds Out podcast, and be constructive, you know, tell us how we can do better. I, I like that. I like, I like when people tell me what we, we, we need, they want to hear and what we can do better. And that, that's, uh, that inspires me. That makes me a better, better, better person, you know? So I like that part. Love it. I love it. Thank you so much, brother. On all our show notes, I'll put all that information. Thank you for taking your time with your busy schedule and I appreciate it, man. Man, my pleasure. Thanks for asking. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Eric, for taking time as busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nozine podcast. Great conversations today. If you guys enjoy this podcast as much as I have, like all weeks, tell your friends, tell your family, spread the word. We're trying to build something special here. Leave a review. Five stars would be absolutely amazing. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward.